Uh, I wasn't here yesterday, so but I, I looked at the program, looked great. I, I just cannot say enough about Josh and Simone and, and Heather uh, about this. What a great service they have done for this community and for us as physicians too. So thank you again for inviting me to come. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my um, history because you will see where I come from with this thing. Uh, in, in 85, I finished my residency in neurosurgery, which was seven and a half years at that point. In my entire residency, I saw one chordoma. That is how rare this disease is. And when I operated with the people, with my attending neurosurgeons, it looked like a, pardon this expression, but it's a neurosurgical term. It looked beautiful, it looked soft, suckable, the tumor comes out easy. It's not like a cancer at all. Very well behaved tumor. So you're always tempted into, you know, going into the tumor, sucking it out, and then calling it quits. But that's where the well behaved ends. It is a nasty tumor. Uh, so I came to the University of Pittsburgh with Dr. Janetta and Dr. Shaker at that time in 85. and saw uh, several chordomas in, in the span of a year and a half. So it's also, I saw a group of diseases called chondrosarcoma in the same area. Very similar, they look similar when you operate, the scans look similar. So there was, it, it intrigued me a lot. So that's when I published my first paper in 89 about this. And there was only 17 cases. So what, when I reviewed the literature, every neurosurgeon, it was primarily seen by neurosurgeons, fibro cordoma I'm talking about, not spine. That's my area of interest. It was the riding, overriding goal of the neurosurgeons to do a minimal approach as possible. The most common approach was the transphenoidal approach that I came across the literature. And just say, go into the tumor, debulk it. And there were times patients had 10, 12 operations, one after the other. So there was something about this disease that they kept coming back. But there were others in which the tumor came back in two, three, four years and just wiped out the patient. And they all looked the same at the time of surgery. So there was something that was strange about this tumor, which intrigued me. That's when I came, in, came to know Dr. Leap. And we have had a relationship for now, what is it, since 87, 22 years, long time with this disease. So, skull base was an interest and passion of mine. We used to do, we have been through a whole spectrum of approaches with this disease. In fact, I think most of the skull base approaches have been spawned by this disease that we do, from maximally invasive stuff to minimally invasive stuff. And a lot of, I have a tremendous amount of this tumor. It is, a, it is like a chameleon. You cannot tell when you start out your first week. So what have we learned? What have I learned in this? We are publishing a paper that's coming out in neurosurgery uh, in our journal of 71 cases of clival chordomas with a follow-up of five years. Now, the key with this disease is it's a slow-growing disease. So everybody is, and when a patient comes to us, he has minimal, if any, symptoms. So you're always tempted, can I make this patient worse? by doing what I do. So as a neurosurgeon, we have to, that's our Hippocratic oath, right? We don't want to make somebody worse than, than what they are. But then you have to see what is down the road for this patient. Am I doing service for this patient by what I'm doing? And that's where looking back at our results makes sense. And you have to have a long enough follow-up to be able to tell that. So as, as we have gone through the entire spectrum of approaches over these 25 years, 22 years that I've dealt with. The, the message comes clearly. Also, I will tell you, there is a difference between a clival chordoma and a sacral chordoma. They are different diseases, even though they're from the same notochord, there are two ends of the spectrum. And, and my study has only been with clival chordoma. The key is, you have to get past the thinking. Yes, as much as I want the patient to be unscathed at the time of the operation, the first attempt at removal of this tumor is the best attempt you can ever have. 
you will never ever have that chance again. And therefore, you have to push the border. This mindset and thinking of treating chordomas is different from a standard neurosurgical or a head and neck operation. You have to understand that. And the onus is on the neurosurgeon to convey that to the family, to convey that to the patient, because they have to know what you know. And they are a layman, a layperson. And the time I spent with patients is, you can ask any patients who are here, it is not one visit, sometimes two, three, four visits to make sure it sinks in. That what is this we are fighting against? We are fighting together. We are not fighting against each other. So they have to know we are in their camp. And there will be tough decisions to make. There will be complications as much as we don't like complications. Do I like complications? No. I like to see my patients doing well. But then I have to remember what does this disease bode for them down the road. So what is the bottom line that I've learned? And I'm not going to show you any slides of this. Is that this is a very rare disease. And the, the, the service that they have done, Josh and Simone, is to make a community. When I started this thing, I could not tell a patient who they should talk to to get some idea about this disease, what it is about, or what they should expect in their life. And, and this is what they've done, brought you all together. So you can talk to each other, you have somebody to relate to. That is very important. Otherwise, it's such an orphan disease that you're out there, left alone, consulting with one doctor here, one doctor there, somebody tells you X, but then another person tells you Y, and you have no idea how to make sense of this. Because obviously, you cannot go through the literature. I can tell you when I read the literature, I come back even more confused. So I say, you know, what should I do? Am I doing the wrong thing? So that's when I decided, you know, I got to look at my work and make a conclusion on this. Because I think there's enough of a follow-up that, that I can make some sense out of it. And what is the bottom line? You have to get all the visible disease out the first time. Whether it was one operation, two operations, through the nose, through the side of the head, doesn't matter. The disease determines or calls for what you need to do. If it's a huge chordoma, you have to devise all kinds of approaches. That's why I tell you that many of these cranial based approaches have been spawned by chordomas because people have to figure out how do we get to this point. And it also brought in the collaboration between ENT, head and neck, and neurosurgery because it is so often in the borderline. But, you know, for the neurosurgeon thinking, the dura is his end point. Whereas the ENT guy looking from the nose or from the ear or whatever, dura is the end point for him. So why not combine the two? That's what spawned the, the, uh, the establishment of the North American Skull Base Society, which, which is uh, uh, so quite a big body of people who devote themselves to this type of tumor. You have to, whoever you see, you have to talk to doctors who are knowledgeable about skull. This is a skull-based tumor, not a standard neurosurgical tumor. This happens more, say, in the pediatric age group, where you will see a pediatric neurosurgeon. That person may not be dealing with skull-based tumors day in and day out. So that, that knowledge, that understanding that this is a special disease comes into play. Gross total resection of the tumor is the goal. So that's what you have to do. Now, radiation supplementation also plays a role, and, and we have worked very often together. What you have to understand is you, you will... I talk to Dr. Leibs so many times because he knows what I can achieve by surgery and I know what he needs from the proton beam radiation point of view. That coordination is also important. Right now, chemotherapy is really not taken into a, a significant mainstream role. What happens, can we predict what a chordoma does? In the number of patients that we have done, we have studied markers called the adhesion uh, molecules. And these are cadherins and catenins. And we saw that this can also predict behavior of chordomas, because there is something called a molecule e cadherin there's another one called n cadherin and we found that overexpression of one has a better prognostication in the long term. But there is no 100%. You saw Dr. Perry's uh, uh, results on that. So gross total resection, proton beam radiation. Sometimes we have held off proton beam radiation if we have a clean resection, because you cannot repeat this dose of heavy radiation. So you want to have another money in the bank, so you can use it later on. And what you have with uh, recurrent disease, still I believe, even in the number of patients that I saw with recurrent disease, gross total resection is still my goal, because that is, that is what leads to a better longer term survi survival than 
a, a partial resection. You leave tumor behind, you know it is coming back. It's just a matter of time. So with that knowledge base, you know, that, that's all I have to share with you. And it's great to be with you all.